We are finally entering the world of Homo erectus, the remarkable ancestor who pioneered what it means to be human. Homo erectus appeared on the African plains almost two million years ago. They were the first ancestors who had bodies like ours. They were hunter-gatherers and tool-makers, beings who lived in social groups and cared for each other. The most famous Homo erectus is the fossil called Turconobor. Well, Turkana Boy and his ancestors, they represent a threshold. They represent that, that point in our evolution when we, were, we weren't quite fully a human, but we were no longer an ape. Paleo artist Victor Deek specializes in creating scientifically based sculptures of ancient humans from their fossil remains. As he reconstructs Turkana Boy's head, ape-like features emerge heavy brow ridges, a protruding lower face, a skull still smaller than our own. But despite these differences, Turkana Boy is definitely starting to look like a human being. And behind those eyes, his mind was becoming human too. I suspect that complex feelings and and behaviors had their beginnings with Turkana Boy's kind, and that what it is to truly be a human had its bubblings at that point. It was probably Homo erectus, almost two million years ago, who first started to leave Africa. Ever since, Africa has been the engine of our evolution, pumping out wave after wave ancient humans who populated Europe and Asia. Settling in far off places, they developed in their own special ways. An early wave gave rise in Indonesia to the extraordinary hobbit, perhaps a type of dwarf Homo erectus. Another wave took Homo erectus all the way to China where fossil remains have been dated to over 700,000 years ago. Soon after, another wave left Africa, this time heading for Europe. This was the species that would one day give rise to the Neanderthal. At the threshold of humanity, one ancestor contains tantalizing secrets. It is known as Homo erectus. Homo erectus had a slightly smaller brain, slightly bigger jaw, but it's basically us. But it's basically us. Basically us, almost two million years ago. New finds are revealing the truth about the ancestors at the heart of our evolution. Here were the trailblazers who first left Africa, the first fire makers, the first hunters. These creatures were capable of analyzing possible uses of tools and coming up with a technological solution to the problem of how you kill a big dangerous animal without getting killed yourself. Homo erectus pioneered what it means to be human, colonizing whole continents and creating the first human societies. Our ancestors began to care about what others thought and care about what that individual thought about them. Now, new discoveries are bringing them alive as never before. At last, we come face to face with the ancestors at the birth of humanity, right now on Nova. The Great Rift Valley of East Africa Two million years ago, these spectacular plains and canyons witnessed a mysterious event. The birth of the first ancestor we can really call human. 
new discoveries are revealing a creature surprisingly like us. A world traveler, a tool maker, a hunter, tamer of fire, creator of the first human societies. Amazingly, the qualities that make us human began not with our own species, Homo sapiens. The true birth of humanity began much further back in time, millions of years ago. About two million years ago, new creatures appeared with abilities never seen before in the animal kingdom. Meet Homo erectus, a toolmaker and hunter. One of the first members of our genus, the genus Homo, humans. The transition to Homo was probably one of the most important transformations that occurred in human evolution. Arms got thinner, legs got longer, brains got bigger. It was a huge evolutionary step from ape bodies to bodies like ours. And here they are, the actual bones of a human ancestor who lived over one and a half million years ago. It's the earliest human skeleton ever discovered. The Leakies called him Turkana Boy. His bones have revolutionized our understanding of the transition from ape to human. What did he look like? His skeleton tells us he was five feet, three inches tall, with a build closer to a man's than an ape's. But how close? Paleo artist Victor Deek specializes in painting and sculpting our human ancestors with precise anatomical accuracy. Victor's going to add Turkana Boy to his family of ancient faces. At this stage of the game, I know that Turkana Boy is not an ape. He is a very early true human. And so here we have a modern human skull. The faces are very similar to one another, but Turkana Boy's skull is a bit more primitive and has a lower forehead and a much smaller brain capacity. Victor will build Turkana Boy's face muscle by muscle based on his studies of cadavers and modern anatomy. While his head may be primitive, Turkana Boy's skeleton is surprisingly human. His hips are a little wider, his arms a little longer, but his overall body shape is just like ours. Turkana Boy and Erectus, that's something that if you were to see from 100 feet away, you would think, well, there's a large naked man there, a woman, or, or, you know, but it's a human. As Turkana Boy's forensically reconstructed head nears completion, a face emerges that looks a lot like us. Now for the first time in a million and a half years, here he is, our ancestor, the Homo erectus called Turkana Boy. But what he looked like is only the beginning of his story. Turkana Boy was already five feet three inches tall. When scientists compared his bones and teeth to ours, he seemed to be about 14 years old. But when dental specialist Chris Dean began to study his teeth, he was in for a shock. When Chris looked at the fossilized teeth of Turkana Boy, he got a huge surprise. Turkana Boy wasn't 14 years old, he was eight. It's a controversial idea, and we'll never know for sure if Turkana Boy could speak. But there are other clues to his intelligence the stone tools he left behind. Homo erectus made tools like this hand axe here. It's been chipped extensively on both sides. The point enables one to do piercing tasks. The heavy bit here can be used for cracking bone or, or chopping wood. It's a very, very versatile tool and a sharp one. It may not look like much, but the stone hand axe marks the birth of technology. Homo erectus has left us many signs of his inventiveness. Here in central Kenya, Rick Potts 
has been studying a treasure trove of Homo erectus stone tools. Stone tools represented a momentous change because once you had tools in your hands, all the foods in the world could open up to you. That represented a tremendous survival advantage. Here is a cache of over 500 stone hand axes made by Homo erectus. Just a mile away, Rick visits the quarry where for thousands of years, these ancestors came to shape stone into tools, leaving behind unused fragments. In the crevices at my feet, there were thousands of fragments of stone from tool making. And there were several scars where Homo erectus struck huge flakes we also see evidence that they could recognize flaws. They could see which ones would break if they took them away. So they simply discarded them here. What's amazing about that is you could imagine a, an early Homo erectus sitting right here making decisions. The kind of decision making it takes to create a stone tool has been researched extensively by John Shea. I'm just gonna tap it a little bit. I'm just checking it out to see if there's any, any internal flaws before I do it. There may be one in here. It feels like there might be something in there, but I like a challenge, so I'll, I'll map it anyway. Even for an expert, making a hand axe is not easy. Yeah, there's a flaw, but we got around it. A good toolmaker has to understand the properties of stone. To make this thing nice and thin, easier to carry, easier to transport, and more to the sharp cutting edge, I'm gonna do something kind of counterintuitive. I'm gonna dull the edge so that the next time I strike it, it won't fail until I have a lot of pressure on it, until I've hit it really hard. The fracture will go much further than it otherwise would. So that Homo erectus did this tells us they were capable of thinking ahead, of planning the consequences of their actions. So let's have a look here. What'll, this, what'll happen here? Many of these stones have hidden defects. Okay. Failing to spot them could spell disaster. There's still a flaw in there, I can hear it. I can, I can tell, yeah, see this? It's right there. Now, I've worked around it, but if I were an early human and spotted this, I would stop making the hand axe right now. If I'm out running around the savannas chasing a rhinoceros and you know, I'm butchering a rhinoceros as the lions are circling and my hand axe breaks, I'm in trouble. So, you know, I go home tonight, I'm still gonna get fed even though I didn't make a perfect hand axe. As Homo erectus, I might end up being the meal instead. You know? A skilled craftsman, Homo erectus had evolved a new type of intelligence. But Turkanoboy's kind were built to run, like us. So, this is an accelerometer. It's Dan Lieberman believes they could run long distances because, like us, they had lost their thick coat of body hair and could keep cool by sweating. This was the key to their success. Turkana boy was mostly hairless, just like us. And that may be what gave him an edge over other predators. Most animals are at a disadvantage in the midday sun because they overheat. They can only cool down by panting. And when they run fast, they can't pant. That means they can only run in short sprints. Quadrupeds can gallop for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then they overheat. But hominids can cool down by sweating. They use their entire body like a, like a dog's tongue. Our hairless bodies allow air to circulate freely on our skin and cool us down as sweat evaporates. This makes us one of the best long-distance runners in the animal kingdom. Dan Lieberman believes this gave our ancestors the ability to hunt in a very unusual way. It's called persistence hunting. And he believes the modern ethnographic record can show us how it was done. The Bushmen of the Kalahari offer us an insight into how Homo erectus might have hunted two million years ago. The Bushmen know that at midday, animals rest in the shade, which is why it's the perfect time to be hunting. Once they locate their prey, in this case, a kudu, the marathon begins.
Their strategy is simple. Run it to exhaustion. Every time the animal tries to rest, the hunters track it down and get it moving again. They never give it a chance to cool down. And the reason they can keep going is that they can sweat. So if the theory is right, the Bushman hunt may help explain how Turkana boy got his meat. Homo erectus had come up with an innovative way of feeding his hungry brain. In this modern hunt, the Bushmen ran in the fierce heat for over four hours. The kudu was finally immobilized by heat stroke. Turkana boy wouldn't have had steel-tipped spears like the Bushmen, but he wouldn't have needed them. Homo erectus probably hunted with close quarters weapons, with spears that were thrown at animals from a short distance, clubs, thrown rocks, weapons like that. They weren't using long distance projectile weapons that we know of. The Homo erectus hunt was simple but effective. It fed not just their larger brains, but the growing complexity of that early human society. There are other social animals, but none quite like us. Society is in every corner of our lives. Our relationships, communication, rules, symbolism, all the things that bind us together. What's behind it? Why do we become so social? Could it have something to do with another innovation, something unprecedented in our evolution, building fires and cooking. Here we've got erectus, the first species that looks like us. And I think only cooking can explain the magnitude of this change. The earliest evidence that our ancestors deliberately used fire for cooking dates to long after Turkana boy's time. But Richard Wrangham is sure Homo erectus was building fires much earlier. Now, for the first time, we had a species that was committed to living on the ground because they lose their climbing adaptations. Well, how were they sleeping? They had to be able to protect themselves from wild animals. On the African savanna, full of predators who hunt by night, Richard believes Turkana boy and his people couldn't have survived without fire. And he thinks only cooking, which makes food more soft and digestible, can explain why Homo erectus evolves smaller teeth and a much smaller gut. These things are compatible with the reduced cost of digestion produced by cooking food. Nothing else is. As our ancestors reaped the benefits of cooking, something else happened too, at least according to Wrangham we became more social. Humans have this wonderfully calm temperament compared to chimpanzees, say. Where did it come from? We were drawn to a common place, the fireplace. Wrangham believes we learn to share and communicate, sitting around fires, waiting for food to cook. It's speculative, but one thing is for sure. In the Homo erectus world, new social relationships had to be evolving. The bonds between mothers and children must have been very different from the apes. Could these social instincts have developed with Homo erectus? Along with cooperative hunting, bigger brains, longer childhoods, and the use of fire. Perhaps Turkana boy and his people already had social skills that would be familiar to us. Here were intelligent social beings with an increasing capacity for cooperation. It may be this that made possible another great achievement, the exodus from Africa. 
For millions of years, our earliest ancestors stayed on the African savannas. But at some point, they started to leave. Ancient fossil skulls and tools have been found as far away as China and Indonesia. A million years ago, our ancestors had populated Asia from the Caucasus to Indonesia. And they were in Europe too, as a recent discovery in Spain has shown. Homo erectus had conquered the old world. The fact that they made it so far with limited technology and relatively small brains makes them seem even more remarkable. And their longevity was astonishing. A few pockets of Homo erectus may have been still clinging on in Asia just 50,000 years ago. That's a span of two million years. Our own species has only been around for 200,000. What was the secret of Homo erectus's success? The amazing finds at Dimenisi have given us one last clue. One of the skulls belonged to an old man. His jawbone revealed he had lost all his teeth well before he died. That was a real surprise. It means that this individual survived two years without teeth. For an elder to have survived that long without teeth must mean that others in the group were feeding him, perhaps even chewing his food for him. I love this story. This was a remarkable testimony from the past about the quality of emotional life that may have characterized Homo erectus. Here is a tantalizing clue to what may be this ancestor's most important legacy, the instinct to look after each other. And it helps us imagine Turkana Boy's final day on Earth. In the animator's scenario, he starts the day out on a hunt but he has trouble keeping up with the hunting party. Why? The evidence from his skeleton is that he was sick and in pain at the time he died. If we look at his lower jaw, we can see right here under the teeth that we've got a bit of an abscess and an infection. That kind of an infection could have entered the rest of his body, could have killed him. An abscess that ate away that much of his jawbone would have been agonizing. Turkana boy is in so much pain, he's unable to continue the hunt. Knowing he would be looked after, perhaps he returned to his campsite to find comfort among the females. I think he was probably a miserable fellow um, in a lot of pain and very dependent on, on support and handouts. So it was a species that already felt that he's one of our weaklings that, you know, we love and must, must protect and care for to have got him that far. But however much they may have wanted to help him, there was nothing they could do about the infection that was probably spreading through his body. From what the evidence suggests, I just always imagined him not knowing what was wrong with him and there's a sadness to it. But ultimately from that comes this immortal being. His skeleton was so complete, it is likely he died in water, which would have protected him. It's very unusual to get a skeleton because normally these things are eaten by carnivore. And in this case, it seems that the boy's body was washed into a swamp, and so the carnivores never saw it and never destroyed it. And it gradually decomposed, and as the rivers flooded, brought in more sediment, buried it. And you could see footprints of hippos that had walked all over the bones, and, and some of the ribs and things were standing vertically instead of lying flat on the ground. And 
you could sort of reconstruct the situation and how, how the boy, had, what had happened after he died and, and why he was complete. It was just, it really was, it was an amazing experience to see it. For almost two million years, his bones were preserved by the earth. Their discovery opened a window for us on an unknown world. The world of the most successful human ancestor of all time, Homo erectus. They've revealed to us that mysterious moment when almost everything human was born. Our bodies, our minds, our emotions. Think of all we've become. Trace the threads of our origins through the ancestors who went before. They all lead back to Turkanaboy and his kind, the first humans. As bone after bone came out of the pit, they realized they had not one, but many complete skeletons. We have around 30 complete skeletons, half a million years old. And this is absolutely unique. These are the skeletons of the ancestors called Homo heidelbergensis, one of the earliest to populate Europe. But why were so many complete skeletons collected in one place? Juan Luis Arsuaga believes they were put there intentionally by their kin. Half a million years ago, the pit of bones, now deep underground, had an opening to the surface. Perhaps Homo heidelbergensis dropped the bodies into the pit in a sort of primitive burial. And there is evidence it may have been ceremonial. Along with the bones, Juan Luis found a single artifact, a hand axe made of pink quartz, a mineral which must have been brought from a long way away. The team called it Excalibur after King Arthur's famous sword. They believed it was an offering, the first symbol ever found. If this is right, here were beings with complex minds, capable of symbolism and belief. Half a million years ago, in these European populations, there was planning, there was consciousness, there was a human mind, and uh, there was also symbolic behavior. We used to think these qualities belonged only to us, Homo sapiens, that the earliest evidence for them was in the painted caves of southern France just 30,000 years ago. But the extraordinary finds at Atapuerca may have pushed the beginnings of that mental evolution back almost half a million years. Homo heidelbergensis would continue to evolve, eventually becoming the species who would populate Europe, the Neanderthals. <laughs> 